Good morning. Good morning. When we meet, then we greet each other by saying good morning. Nobody says bad morning, right? Similarly, in the case of our name also, we try to get a good name, like Sumitra or Suchandra or Pavitra or Mary or Jesus or Kunga, you know, all the good names. Nobody has a name called Booth, Kala Booth. <laughs> Huh? Devil or things like that. Why? Why we want good name? Why we greet each other saying good morning? Everyone wants happiness. Exactly. Every everyone wants to be good. Everyone wants to be happy. So when it comes to spiritual practice, it doesn't have to be unnecessarily complicated. So every time you greet each other by saying good morning, you should remember that I should spend this morning in a good way. It's not enough just to say good morning and then start fighting. Good morning. Then again reminder, good afternoon. Then again reminder, good evening. Then good night, peaceful sleep. You know, in fact, in the tantric practice, there, there is a process when you receive Abhishek or initiation or empowerment, then a special name is given. When you become a monk or nun, also special name is given. So this name symbolizes the possibility to change. When you become a monk or nun, three changes take place. Change your cloth, and then most importantly, change your attitude. That's the most important thing. And most difficult thing, and most difficult thing, because it's most difficult thing because we are prone to dealing with only the materialistic uh, and the manifest things. Jo samne hai, jo dekh sakta hai, jo sung sakta hai, jo touch kar sakta hai, usi ke peeche dorte rehte hain log. We never try to go inside and bring about changes within our mind. Everybody talks about changing the world, changing the climate. Hannah, like look, look at this, these days, especially Saturday and Sunday, so many tourists are coming here. Dharamsala is not particularly beautiful or things like that. But because of a little bit cooler climate, people come here. Kitina achai, sundar, cool. Plants, green, green. Jahan tum rehta hai, wahan green to sab abne tor diya. You see, this is a paradox. You know, people are so short-sighted, ignorant. Huh? Hey na, hai ki nahi? And you destroy plants, environment, flower, flower, everything outside. Then you plant a flower in your small pot. Huh? Right? We are, we are, our life is very paradoxical. So therefore, Buddhist teaching says, don't lead this paradoxical life. Love is impermanent, but you pretend you are permanent. Love is without permanent self, but you pretend there is a permanent self. Love has a lot of problems, sufferings, but you pretend, take it, take it. So therefore, we need to come out of this paradoxical life. So therefore, every time somebody calls by your name, try to live a life befitting your name. So all of you have d different responsibilities, depending upon your name. So that's what I wanted to say right in the morning, after saying good morning. Any questions? I'll be happy to deal with all your questions. No questions? Very good. Yeah, I, I, because instead of me sitting here and talking and talking, you know, ask questions, make it more interactive. Yeah. 
गुड मॉर्निंग यशिला सॉरी गुड मॉर्निंग गुड मॉर्निंग यशिला या या हाउ डू यू अंडरस्टैंड कर्मा इन टर्म्स ऑफ मॉडर्न वर्ल्डली एक्शंस इज इट ड्यू टू पास एक्शंस ऑफ इंडिविजुअल्स और अ कम्युनिटी और इज इट सोशियो पोलिटिकली कंस्ट्रक्टेड इफ इट इज रिलेटेड टू पास एक्शंस और कर्मा देन हाउ कैन वी ओवरकम थ्रू इट Uh, I don't know this socio uh, political constructed layers <coughs> within human is real or past actions of karma. Yeah so karma as I explained yesterday karma basically means action. Every action has a reaction. This called boomerang boomerang effect. Every action is a reaction. Right so you don't have to go very far. The situation you are in the situation I'm in is particularly dependent upon my thinking my conduct my behavior and particularly uh, particularly dependent on the social economical environment which also influences us not not only influences but unfortunately many a times we are helplessly carried by that surrounding environment this in the sea of human beings in the sea of gadgets and things like that you are just overwhelmed yesterday we spoke a little bit about the barrage of information you know you really become unless you are a little bit strong unless you have some kind of integrity you are you are led by the nose therefore it is important in life to have the capacity to say no and i always emphasize by saying to say no politely not rudely aaj night club hai party hai aur bolne se acha acha bol ke you know today also you go there tomorrow somebody says either acha acha bol ke udhar bhi jala fir tu apna what is your stand it is it is true that it is important to do little bit of socializing you know especially when you are young right but the important thing is is it beneficial in the long run is it something that i really want to do is it something that by my presence there will be really needed or useful for that person you need to think other people will send you all the all kind of invitations idhar aao udhar aao to phir to bina soche samjhe you do the silly walking you know wo nahi karna chahiye kyunki yesterday we discussed that life is short there are too many things to do life is short and we also discuss about the importance of concentration concentration is not concentrating just on anything although we in meditation we talk about concentration and then generally speaking you can you know achieve that concentration based on a flower or based on water and things like that right but in the end of the day concentration is not just able to make your mind stay on any object the the ultimate objective of concentration is to be able to concentrate in helping other sentient beings as an ink pura jane ke aise bhi battle kiya there is an old story at the time of the buddha there was a great meditator indian meditator by the name called udrak it is said that his concentration power was so strong that he used to sit in that one single point in meditation for days on end without eating you know anything completely oblivious of his situation and his hair started growing down all the way and touched the ground and in his cave there were a lot of rats so the rats started cutting the end of his hair still he is oblivious of all that his concentration was so strong but then gradually he, he when he got up from that concentration and so that the ends of his hair has been chopped off he grew mad to the to the to the rats so that's what i'm saying so just concentrate concentration is important provided if you use it for a beneficial purpose right so therefore the, therefore what you know my my main answer is that all the happenings are due to karma now when we talk about karma there is karma or action there is individual karma there is a collective karma what will be the fate and what will be the state of dharamsala is dependent on individual karma as well as 
collective karma of all the people living in Dharamsala, plus what is contributed by the visitors, <laughs> tourists. Huh? So, so to simplify it, if, if people in Dharamsala or Himachal Pradesh, let us make it just Dharamsala, if people are really concerned about the environment of Dharamsala, if they really dedicate their life, if everybody goes out, you know, planting flowers, trees, and things like that, you can really, in, in, I, I can promise you can, in, in less than one year, you can make Dharamsala beautiful, as simple as that. Huh? People should work, clean, plant things, and then the government, the rules and regulation, you know, makers, they should go around check whether things are you know, properly preserved or not. If all these things are there, you can change it. Within one year, I can promise. Since I become director, I try to change a little bit. It's not very beautiful, but not ugly. I started a small green club. I started a small staff welfare committee. The Green Club is so so not so successful, but just today I discussed about bringing more flowers. But the staff welfare committee was very successful because we have around 60 staffs and people could get accident, people could get sick, you know, who will look after them? And many of them are young, right? So they'll say that director has to look after them, the secretary has to look after them, you know, technically speaking but we will not be able to look after them all the time. So therefore I, I you know, started this staff welfare committee, which will you know, be done in rotation. Around 10, 12 staffs will be their duty for one year, the next time, next group. So it will, you know, your turn will come up to five, six years, which is not too difficult. It made such a huge difference. When any, anybody is sick, everybody, those welfare committee, they'll immediately go look after them. So this is nothing big, but what I'm saying is, if you have this wish to help and benefit others, you can do many great things. So collective karma. So individual karma, you know, what kind of feeling you are having today? Happiness, suffering, you know, your mind is happy, not happy, not happy, dependent upon many karmas that you do. Like for example, if your health is not very good, still if you continue to take junk food, do the action of eating junk food, <laughs> the result will be headache. Right? As simple as that, much of the problem that we are facing today is our own creation. And I'm just take a small example of food that we intake. Huh? Yeah, I eat a lot Somebody said today, since the cooking started, people are eating at least two, three times more than they used to eat since the cooking started. Now today, not only cooking, but all the packaged foods, which looks very attractive. God knows how old they are. So easy, you know, you buy it and eat it. So eating maybe now three, four times than what your body needs. So much of the problem disease that we have is not shortage of food, but overeating. And not realizing the nature of impermanence not realizing the nature of the fragility of our body. Fragility of our body. Anything that is fragile is packed nicely. If you, if you want me to prove that point, anything, according to the modern package system, packaging system, anything that is fragile is packed nicely. Not only that, after having packed it, then they'll write a letter there saying, fragile, handle carefully. So I'm ask, going to ask the organizers to put a placard on each of your neck saying, fragile, handle me carefully. <laughs> so now look at your body. The fragility of your body is, in Buddhism we call it impermanence, grosser impermanence, subtle impermanence. But if we see it from the modern packaging system, I mean, look at your body, packed so nicely. Whatever is fragile is deep down the internal organs, the lungs, the intestines, you know, the heart, everything that is fragile is packed nicely inside. Then it is covered with these bones, the ribs, then plastered with the flesh. 
Then on that we use skin. Skin, how many layers? Seven skin layers. Packed nicely. Because it's packed so nicely, we, are, we, we go after the appearance, the external appearance. So think, I can put anything. I can eat anything. But when it goes inside, who does the work? All these fragile machines inside. Because we are always hurry, you know, talking, thinking, not, not digesting, not tasting the food. Then you gulp down. The real digestion process of digestion starts, as you know, right here, mixing with the saliva properly. And then chewing it at least 21 times. There's a phrase called swallow the solid, chew the liquid. It looks paradoxical, but swallow the solid means the solid things, you should chew it so nicely so that you are able to swallow it. Even those which, which, are, which are like liquid, you should chew it. Don't just think this is liquid and gulp down. Test it, mix it with your saliva. And if you don't do it and quickly, you know, with just two, three kind of chewing, if you send it down, then those responsible down there, they'll say, Udar se kam thik kar ke nahi aya. Chalo jalne do sale ko niche chhod do. Then this is how you get sick. <laughs> This is how you get sick, you know. So you need to understand all these things. Forget about not understanding the rest of the world. Understand your body. Understand your mind. Understand how to take care of yourself. And you'll be able to do that only when you realize how fragile the internal organs are, you know. Lungs go deko. Sans kaan se aata hai. These tiny, tiny kind of tubes. Thora se blockage ho gaya to. So fragile. Hena. So all this you need to... So therefore, the, the importance of understanding the Buddhist concept of impermanence is not only saying you are going to die, but to understand all this natural fragility. And once you understand that, then you will be very careful. Just like if you have a very fragile, important watch or clock, you will be very careful. It's called not it with, with external objects, we are very careful. Gir jayega, tur jayega. And khud ko girne do, tutne do. Khel nahi rakta hum lo. Or khas kargi, when you are going, you have your ears blocked and singing song and car will come in. I mean, many stupid things that they are doing. So we are dying much before the real death. So in one sense, today, because of ignorance, we are committing a global suicide through killing each other, through by not taking care of oneself, things like that. So these are practical and extremely important. And for that, for that you don't need to listen to a you know, lengthy Buddhist teaching. Just you know, use the scientific findings. And the important thing is when you talk about health, the most important thing is you should never get sick possible so that you don't have to go to hospital you don't have to go to doctor if you ha you are already there in the hospital doctor you it's already a little bit late and as well you know the doctors you know the medicines you know the modern medicines they are you know basically business oriented all kind of pills, you know, this is good for eye, this is good for ear, this is good for stomach, you know. In the, in the so-called developed countries, almost everybody is popping off a handful of pills every day. So all these useless things. So therefore, when we talk about karma, there is a collective karma, there is individual karma. It doesn't have to be a karma that committed in the past life, that is also there. So it's very complex. It is very complex because if you try to pinpoint, then it's very difficult. The Buddha said, it's only me and somebody like me can say who is who, not ordinary individuals. Like, for example, here, we have 20, 30 people. 
somebody has the nose a little bit longer, somebody has nose a little bit shorter, kisi ka kaan thora bada hai, kisi ka thora chota hai. You know, a little bit different, you know. And what, what is the karma for this? It cannot pinpoint. Of course, it has to come from karma. Because the karma is basically the karma for our body is the, the, the body that we inherited from our parents. Therefore, therefore, normally you look very similar to your parents, you know. <laughs> okay, and the next question. <laughs> I want to know what's enlightenment, what's nirvana. When can we say that one has achieved enlightenment or achieved nirvana? And addition to this, I would like to ask you: Are you enlightened? If yes, why? If no, why? And since we are discussing about karma, how this concept is related with karma also? Mm -hmm. So whether it's enlightenment or, or nirvana, everything has to come from their respective causes and conditions. Without respective causes and conditions, nothing can come about. So whether it's nirvana, enlightenment, they're also dependent on causes and conditions. Now nirvana, when we talk about nirvana, there are two kinds of nirvana. Hmm? Um, actually three. Nirvana with the residue, Nirvana without residue and non-abiding Nirvana. Now I'm using very technical terms. Nirvana with residue, Nirvana without residue, and non-abiding Nirvana. Non-abiding Nirvana. Now Nirvana with, with residue means, Nirvana is basically a state of your mind. Okay? Nirvana basically means, state of liberation, state of total freedom. Freedom from what? Freedom from suffering. And the causes of suffering, the negative emotions, and also the seeds of negative emotions. When you have removed suffering, the, the causes of suffering, the negative emotions, and the seeds, everything, then you get completely liberated. That is called nirvana. Now in that, that state, there are three. Three means there are those who are mentally not only liberated, but also without physical form, residue. So that's nirvana without residue. Then there are those who have actualized nirvana and also still possess the body. So that is nirvana with residue. Then, then according to Mahayana teaching, when you get completely enlightened, become a Buddha, then that's called non-abiding nirvana. Non-abiding because you don't abide either in samsara, of course, and you also don't abide in solitary nirvana. <clears throat> now, solitary nirvana means nirvana, there are two types. One, <clears throat> nirvana in the form of complete enlightenment, when in the case of Buddha, he's completely enlightened, and also had actualized the state of nirvana, definitely. So that state of <clears throat> nirvana, which is complete enlightenment, that is called non-abiding nirvana, because you, you know, neither reside in that samsara, nor you reside in that solitary nirvana. Solitary nirvana means there are those who are not completely enlightened, but who have achieved nirvana. How, how this is possible? This is possible because among sentient beings, there are too many different mental dispositions. There are those who think, and then they say, yes, it is very important to help everybody, but it is really impossible to help everybody. Impossible. I mean, this is true, it's not easy. Much easier, easier to say than, than to do it. I'm talking about all sentient beings. Forget about all sentient beings. You will, not, you will have difficulty dealing with 20 people. And there are people who you help, but they demand more and more. They make you more problem. <laughs> Unfortunately, this is human problem. Then I give up. I'll just get liberated for myself and rest. So that is called solitary nirvana. Nirvana just for oneself. Then there are people who have broader mind, the bodhisattvas, who will say that this is selfish. It's true that you, you are liberated, but it's selfish achievement because you're thinking only about yourself. What about the rest of sentient beings? They have acted as your mother, as your parents, as your brothers, as your sisters in these countless lives which you may not remember, which you may not recognize, but they have all been. 
your brother, sisters, father, mother, and so forth. Not only that, in this life also, you know, whatever you are enjoying, they are result of, you know, direct, you know, result of uh, help and kindness of other people. So how can, how can you just think about yourself and satisfy it? So therefore, they, they postpone their personal liberation and endeavor to get completely enlightened, completely omniscient, then they become Buddha. So in that state, that is called non-abiding nirvana because you don't abide in samsara, one extreme, and also don't abide in that nirvana, solitary nirvana, just for oneself. Now the meaning of enlightenment, the English word enlightenment is very confusing because even when you get some new idea, new knowledge, then normally you say, oh, I'm enlightened, you know. We are not talking about that enlightenment. We are talking about complete enlightenment. Complete enlightenment means you have removed all kind of suffering. You have removed all kind of negative emotions. You have removed all the kind of seeds for the negative emotions. Not only that, that much is there in Nirvana also. On top of that, you have removed even the imprints of negative emotions, which are more subtle, more difficult to remove. Just like, just like if you chop a piece of garlic, huh? and then having chopped it, you remove the garlic seed, but still there is a lingering smell there. So even that is removed. No traces at all. Okay? So, and then you, we believe that the Buddha knows everything and all. We call him omniscient and things like that. That is called complete enlightenment. Now with regard to your question whether I'm enlightened or not, I was enlightened 10 years before. <laughs> I'm joking, I'm joking. <laughs> this is like, I mean, honestly speaking, achieving nirvana, forget about enlightenment. Achieving nirvana enlightenment is almost, I'm not discouraging you, this is fact. Almost impossible. I'm not saying impossible, that will be totally against Buddhist teaching. But given our strong habituation in ordinary ways of things, negative emotions, things like that. We are completely stuck in the quagmire of negative emotions. It's not easy to get in Irvana or in enlightenment. Dr. Mas was the 50th birth year here in Nirvana. Yeah? Yeah, yeah that of course, I, as I said, he is completely enlightened. Yes. The 50 years of his uh, birth, he attained Nirvana, Dr. Mas. Oh, maybe, maybe many lives, yeah. Many lives, result of you know cumulative effects of many lives. So maybe I mean, I mean, look, look at for example, forget about enlightenment. Look at look at what Einstein said. That that Einstein, as a scientist, he said, I'm not able to use even five percent of my brain. <laughs> so what about us? <laughs> Eight percent we need. And he said, if I'm able to use something like, I don't know the exact number, he said, if I'm able to use like 10% of my brain, I can make, make miracles. He said that, you see? The, the, he realized the potential, the capacity. And he said, even when I achieve a little bit of thing in my specific field, people see me almost like a god, see? Then in the case of the Buddha, somebody, I think a scientist wrote that the Buddha is the greatest scientist the world has ever produced. Not because he invented, you know, how the quarks function, how the lipidons function, how the atoms function, things like that, how the brain function. But, but his reason was Buddha is the greatest, you know, scientist the world has ever produced because he showed, he found the path to completely eradicate negative emotions, which no scientist has done so far. You see, which is true, which is true, yeah. Okay, next question. Uh, then what is the difference between nirvana and enlightenment? I already said, enlightenment, complete, complete enlightenment. Buddha Jubalda, complete enlightenment means, you, complete enlightenment means you have already removed not only the negative emotions and the seed, but also the imprints left behind by negative emotions. If you achieve just nirvana, not enlightenment, then you have not removed the imprints. And is the mukti same as nirvana? Yeah, yeah. Hmm. Mukti, nirvana is a generic term. 
Yeah. So is his holiness enlightening? I can't say. Many people believe he's enlightened. What we can say is that he is definitely a very compassionate person, knowledgeable person. But whether he's enlightened or not, very difficult to see. Even if the Buddha come here, we'll not be able to see him as enlightened person. Because he will come, even the enlightened people, they, the very reason that they come into this world is to help us. In order to help us, in order to be able to help us, he has to come like us. अगर आपने बिल्ली को मदद करना है तो अंग्रेजी बोलने से कुछ नहीं होगा तिब्बती बोलने से कुछ नहीं होगा क्या बोलना है मिया आई यूज टू डू दैट यू नो वेन आई वॉज यंगर आई यूज टू गो टू सी माई पेरेंट्स यू नो देन दे आर बकरी होते हैं बाहर फिर मैं देख के बोलते मिया या No, no, nirvana is permanent. Nirvana is the mere cessation of negative emotions. The state, the state, mere cessation of negative emotions, which your mind has achieved. Mind itself is impermanent, but what you have achieved is permanent. Yeah, Udar, Sri, Jalaim, Sri. Yeah, okay. Whoever. Uh, but you mentioned that uh, a state of mind, for example, if a person has achieved nirvana, but given the condition change, for example, if I isolated myself or I've entered a very healthy environment and I've achieved nirvana, but if I go back into, you know, an, yeah? The state you have achieved is a state which will not change in whatever situation you are. It's, it's not, don't measure that with our mind. In our case, yes, we are, you know, carried by the situation, but they are not like that. Something like kabi na badalne wale rishte, something like that. Ah, ye hona chahiye na. Dekho, forget about nirvana. In our case, also, that's why that's why we talk about the need to have integrity. Once you understand, once you develop conviction, once you are sure about something. Then you say, yes, whichever country I go, whichever place I go, whoever I meet, this is my way of life. Is tarah ka dirdita pulta hai na, wo hona chahiye. Aisa nahi ki hawa ke jongi ki tarah idhar phengda hai, udhar phengda hai. That's why the Buddha in one of the Mayana Sutra, he says, don't be like a cotton, or don't be like, the, like a feather of the bird. When you are like the feather of the bird, with the slight blow of wind, you, will, you are tossed all around. Take it So that then that's, that's why you get you get problem. This is important question. This you get problem, right? Therefore, you need to realize that you are not made or tailored to entertain other people. You are not cut putili. Other people will you know pull the string and then you sing and dance. You know no, you have your own stand. Therefore, the most important question in our life is how you choose your life. The decisions that you make, the choices that you make, that's totally in your hand. So you should be worrying about that. You should be concerned about that. Not about what other people are you know, reacting. Not how the situation environment is reacting. Because you don't have control over the External situations, external friends, however good they are, a bindi kar sakta hai, ro sakta hai, request kar sakta hai, lekin no nahi badalne se, ab kuch nahi kar sakta hai. They are not under control. What is our control, uh, under our control is our way of life, our thinking. So we do the other way around. You know, you try to dance in the twin of other people, other situation. Like for example, sun, when the sun is extremely hot and you are bothered by the heat of the sun, huh? then what, what should you do? Change yourself or change the sun? 
Huh? Change yourself means go into a shady place, use umbrella, stay in room, whatever, if it is too hot. That's the solution. It's not the solution that you look at the sun and start cursing. Damn the sun, it's so hot, you know. <laughs> you curse the whole day. The sun will never say, Madam, sorry. <laughs> I, I didn't realize that it's so hot. I'm, I'm going to be becoming colder. Never say. Similar with how you deal with other people. This is a very important lesson that is taught in Buddhism, that is taught right from Aristotle and so forth. And you need to realize that you are the only original copy in this world. A duplicate may help. Then also you need to realize. Because there are many people who say, I'm inferior. I'm not so intelligent. I'm not so sharp. I have no supporters. I can't do. Don't say that. As I said, you are the only original copy means you have special talents. You have special capacities. Abhi dekho, Pradhan Mantri upar se bol bara bashan deke ja raha hai. Lekin uska sapalta, unless the people under him work, he will not succeed. Chabrasi idhar saab nahi kar raha hai. Mechanics, computer fix nahi kar raha hai. Kya kar? Gush nahi kar sakta upar wala. Right? So you need to realize, and in Buddhism we say, all of us, not only all of us human beings, but also the tiniest, you know, seemingly helpless insects have Buddha nature, Buddha potential. The Buddha nature means the capacity to grow, your mind's capacity to grow and to learn. If you realize the capacity of your, your mind, it is like the capacity is beyond imagination. It is it's much more than gigabyte, you know, or terabyte even. People say, no, it's me, it's me, it's terabyte, gigabyte. You know? You can put so much inside it. You know? You need to realize that. And there is, there is no problem which you cannot solve. Provided, you know, then, and then in that case, of course, as, as Shanti Deva in his text, famous text says, if it is something you can change, don't worry, because you can change it. If it is something you can't change it, no use worrying, because by worrying you can't change it. As simple as that, you see. Okay. Yeah. So uh, just now you mentioned about the nirvana. Hmm? So just now you mentioned about the nirvana, right? Hmm. So as per the yoga darshan, basically the Patanjali Yoga Sutra, hmm. it hmm. says that we can get, uh, so we can relate with it. Like hmm. nirvana can be a samadhi and kaivalya can be an enlightenment. Is that right? Samadhi leads to nirvana. Yeah. Samadhi leads to enlightenment. Yeah, so that can be kaivalya part, right? <coughs> kaivalya samadhi, that can we say? Samadhi? Uh, enlightenment can be a kaivalya, the dharma medha samadhi. Yeah, when you achieve enlightenment, then you have the capacity to completely remain in samadhi all the time. Yeah. So for this, uh, as per the Patanjali Yoga Sutra, they have given the five ways. Janma, yeah. Mantra, Aushadi, Tapas, Samadhi. Yeah. So when we talk about, uh, just now we spoke about the karma also. Yeah. So when we talk about the karma, yeah. so that will lead us to the janma, and yeah. janma will lead us to the nirvana yeah. or samadhi. Yeah. So uh, we have four types of karmas. Yeah. That is uh, prarabdha, sanchita, and karyamana. Yeah, yeah. So uh, our karyamana karma we can change yeah. because that is now. Yeah. But what about the sanchit karma? How can we change that so that in this life yeah. we can achieve something yeah. better? Yeah. So normally we say there are many different types of karmas. Physical karma, verbal karma, mental karma, contaminated karma, uncontaminated karma. And there are results of certain karma which you cannot change right now also. For example, if you are born without one hand, that you can't change. 
right? But then you think about the possibility, many possibilities of your mind. Then there are many things you can change. Okay? Does that answer your question? So what, what was your Sanchita, what was that? That karma means what we say, we are getting the fruits of previous yeah, karmas, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. So already we are getting the fruits of that. Yeah, 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 yeah. So how to remove those seeds so that we cannot carry forward the fruits of that or whatever, if mm. they are going to mm. bloom, mm. how to stop that? Mm. So with, with, with karma, with action, again there are many types. A karma which is uh, accumulate, uh, which is done, which is committed, but not accumulated. Karma which is uh, uh, committed, not done. Karma which is not committed, not done. Karma which is done and also committed. There are different types of karmas. So generally speaking, whatever karma you have committed, it can be purified through adopting the four opponent powers. Four opponent powers. One, you should repent and regret over the negative karmas that you have done. Just like you have taken poison. You have to realize that was wrong. Regret it. Then you should do the second practice which is called uh, making a commitment basically, which you will say that I will never do such an action again. And then you can also recite certain, as you mentioned, some mantras and uh, cultivate the mind of loving kindness, compassion, bodhicitta and so forth. And then cultivating the, the right counter forces against those karmas. Okay. Cultivating the direct counter forces. For example, if you if you have a, a accumulated negative karma out of anger, then the counter force is patience. Practice of patience. Okay, things like that. If you develop a strong karma out of attachment, then the the next karma that you need to accumulate is seeing the limitation and the ugly side of that object. So that will stop. Yeah. Okay. <coughs> Can In I other words, let, let me simplify this a little bit. It may not have become very clear. For example, if you are, let us say, because of certain karma, you have, a, you, you have a, let us say, trend of thinking. And may, maybe it is the trend of uh, your mind which, where you feel depressed and where you feel unhappy, where you start suffering. That's the karma, result of karma, whatever. So that trend can be changed by adopting positive ways of life. Not only highlighting that problem, that difficulty, but highlighting the, you know, the positive capacity and sight that you have. So that will stop the flow of that, that effect. But then, of course, as I said, there are certain results which already ripened, you can't do. <laughs> okay? Uh, my, my question is, uh, I think the history of the country has its own importance, and if it can be used wisely, it can help. History of what? History of any, any country has its own importance. Yes, yes, yes. So, uh, if it can be used wisely, it can help in free Tibet movement, as in case of India. So, my question is here. My question is, uh, why there is not so much emphasis on Tibetan history, the kings, their conquerings? Uh, do Tibetans are missing something very important? Uh, from past 14, 15 days, we have uh, never heard about a single king of Tibet. Uh, and also, there was so much emphasis on uh, His Holiness and only His teachings. Why there is not so much emphasis on uh, Tibetan history? That, that you should ask the organizers. <laughs> why why the, the, the topic is not there? <laughs> you know, during this short trip, you don't have to, you know, get everything. So depending upon what program you have actually, you know, made, you will, you will get that opportunity. 
and then depending upon what questions you ask, now they have they ask this question, so so then I can answer. You see, history, geography, barehe veba rat gopare savere sab. So so history is as 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 important, of course, and then we do have many many great kings like the thirty third king Sungzin Gambo, whose painting I've done after I become director in the entrance the father of Tibetan literature who invented Tibetan script on the one hand and the Tibetan king on the other side. So, so at that time, the, the, the Tibet was so powerful that it conquered many neighboring places, <laughs> including India, including China, you know. So those stories are there. So if you're interested, you can read more. It's not so difficult to understand. No, and why that cannot be used as a catalyst uh, in free Tibet movement? Is it happening really on the ground or else uh, of course. just the teachings? Of course, of course. So when you say why it is not used, are you talking about what? To talking about who? There are many who are, who are doing that. You may not have known that. <laughs> there are many who are doing that. Yeah, it's important, very important. Because we, we need to prove that historically Tibet is an independent country, not a part of China. Right? So if you are more interested, then I suggest that you read this book. I don't know whether it's easily available, but we do have a copy in the library, Authenticating Tibet. Authenticating Tibet, which is response to 100 questions the Chinese government asked for the sake of justifying their deed. They asked 100 questions and then answered by themselves, okay? So as a response to this, I think 17 uh, scholars on Tibetan studies, which included three Tibetan scholars, and then rest, I think, uh, foreigners, 13 or 15, 15 or 17 scholars. They wrote a book, which is a response to this. And according to them, they say what we are answering is completely unbiased, based on history. So it is there. There are many books like that. Then you can also read this book, Hidden Tibet, which is relatively new. We published it, it's available in English, Hidden Tibet, which was published, which was actually written by one of my Russian friend, professor. He first wrote it in Russian, and then uh, later it was translated into English, and we published it. So there, we have many number of books here, even for sale. And then in the main library, there are so many books. Thank you. Yeah. So a very cursory look. I was having to the concept of, uh, like you yesterday explained us about Shunyata. Hmm. So I was just trying to go through it. And I came across few texts from the Western authors who have probably wrongly misconceptualized it in some ways and probably compared it with nihilism. <coughs> rejection of everything. So probably, um, um, and I, then I came across how Nagarjuna also said that if you understand it and grasp it in a wrong way, it's probably uh, taking a snake from the opposite side. So uh, I really wanted to have more of your insight on the topic and how should we not wrongly understand it and what's the right way to understand very it. Very good, very good. So you need to first understand two things. One. The mathematical concept of zero, philosophical concept of shunyata, as far as I understand, both are originated in India. They are very similar. Like the mathematical concept of zero originated in India, but of course it was supported strongly by some, you know, uh, some other countries. Basically they are very similar. Now in the case of, if I give a kind of parallel explanation, in the case of zero, normally when I say I have zero money, that means you have no money at all. But in mathematical con conception, zero is almost like the foundation. Without zero you can't have 10, 20, 100, 1000, and so forth. So it's not equal to nothing. Similarly, the philosophical concept of shunyata or emptiness is not equal to nothingness. 
Now two things, I will simplify it and it will be quite clear. Two things, few things you need to understand. Things exist. You exist, I exist, water exists, paper exists, things like that. Things exist. When things exist, there are only two ways of existence. Either they should exist dependently, depending on cause, condition, whatever, dependently, or they should exist independently. Dependent existence and independent existence are mutually exclusive. Either this or this, there is no third possibility. Mutually exclusive. Now you should think about everything, like this cup, it's existing. Is it, exi is it existing dependently or independently? I'm asking you the question. Is this existing dependently or independently? Dependently. Huh? Dependently. dependently. Are you existing dependently or independently? Dependent. There you are. Because you and other things are existing dependently, therefore there is nothing that has independent existence. Siddhi Bhad. So therefore emptiness means empty of empty of sub kuch dependent hai. Therefore, there is nothing that has independent existence. Therefore, emptiness means empty of independent existence. Clear? Should be very clear. Is that clear? A little bit confused. I'll repeat this again. Anything that is that exists has to exist either dependently or independently. Now, Dependent existence, I'll explain this a little bit. When we say dependent existence, it may be dependent existence due to it is dependent on causes and conditions. There's one way of dependence. The second is, it may be dependent on the parts or the whole. Like this part is dependent on the whole body. The whole body is dependent on the part. That's one way of dependence. The third is dependence. This is the most, you know, Comprehensive. Dependence through designation, through conception, through designation. For example, this is called mobile phone. And what do we call this one? Microphone. Microphone. Who gave this name, mobile phone? Somebody. Now, because somebody gave this name mobile phone, it's not a big problem, we agreed to it, we started repeating it. Now today, if I say this is not, not mobile phone, this is elephant. I will speak through my elephant, elephant. you will laugh. Because now a social convention has been established, I cannot go against it. But this social convention, this name mobile phone came through designation. Originally, if the person who gave the name did not give the name mobile phone but microphone, today everybody will have no problem. I will speak through the microphone. <laughs> mobile microphone. <laughs> have no problem. And look at our name. If you are Sumitra, whatever, your parents give the name and everybody said. But it was not like that right from the beginning. You know, for many lives you have been Sumitra. Yes, and yet. Nam and Nam badal bhi sakta hai. You know, many places all over India they are changing depending upon their political needs, you know. So their designation or kuch bhi nahi hai. So in this case, even the impermanent phenomena and even the permanent phenomena, they exist only through dependence, through designation. So there is nothing that is beyond this kind of dependence. So therefore we say there is nothing that has independent existence. So therefore emptiness means empty of 
independent existence. That's clear, huh? That's clear, but you need to understand why do we have to bother our you know, dear head with this concept of Shunya. This huh? The reason, the big reason behind understanding that Shunya is normally to our uncautioning mind, we, when, when we tend to see things, relate to things, especially when we tend to see something which is attractive, which we, we fancy, which we like, then we don't see it as existing dependently. We see it, wow, kitna sundar hai. That sundar da is from its own side. Hundred percent, wow, beautiful, so beautiful. And what is, what is wrong with that? The wrong with that is, <laughs> number one, it is misconception, because there's nothing that is 100% beautiful, 100% ugly. And then you, you, when you exaggerate and give such a designation, then you develop attachment. You get obsessed with that. Mujhe yehi chahi hai. Iske bina me nahi reh sakta. Me nahi jee sakta. Mar jaungi. Buduram. You are stupid. We are really stupid. You know, you are really stupid. I remember that story very well. Once there was a you know, talk about Michael Jackson visiting India. Then young people are so excited. Hey, Michael Jackson. Are Especially some girls very excited. And then there was a second news saying he is not coming. Some girls fainted. It's happening, not Michael Jackson alone, it's happening today. Look at many of the shows, you know, people get so carried away by that song show and then they faint and there are a group of people who, you know, expect such fainting and who are ready to escort and take them away, their body physically. Pagalpan. So we, we can, our senses can be duped. We can be led into a wrong direction very easily. So therefore, once you understand, as, as we discussed yesterday, when you see things as a dream, as illusion, yes, it looks beautiful, but it's like rainbow, you know. There's not much essence there. Sab marne wala hai. Sab nashwar hai. When you see these things, yes, you enjoy, but not get completely crazy. And similarly with your so-called enemy, like for Tibet, say that, the Chinese communist enemy. So we may have this very strong emotion, negative emotion against China, and then we'll say, they are horrible. They are incorrigible. They are outright negative. They are fit to be killed, short. We think like that. But then you calm down your mind a little bit. Yes, they are also people. They are also influenced by their powerful leaders. They are also helpless. Chinese people also suffering. They are also like us, human beings. Huh? They also have many good things also, not just bad things. They are not embodiment of bad things alone. When you see like that, you see. Now, I'll give you some example. For example, that's why His Holiness the Dalai Lama is always saying, they talk to Chinese people, talk to Chinese students. Don't give their distance. Talk to them. They're, they're human beings. And I did experiment with that myself. And after talking to meeting some of these people who come from even mainland China, things like that, when you talk to them, you realize that they're also ordinary human beings. They also have their wish to happiness and wish to shun suffering. Then later on, you know, you don't develop that strong enmity. You at least remember, yes, yes, I have one friend, Chinese friend in Shanghai or in Beijing or things like that. Then you, that, that sourness, that bitterness goes down, you see. Right? So it is because of this strong grasping and seeing things as having inherent, independent existence, we, we become kind of immobile, insensitive. Just like understanding impermanence, they are all similar. But understanding impermanence, this emptiness is much deeper much deeper. Right? Yeah. <clears throat> uh, 
hello kishla i just wanted to ask about the difference between like pagan religions and abrahamic religions like in paganism we have belief which religion like pagan, pagan, pagan religions pagan. Yeah, like, i don't know i don't know okay i should not pretend i know everything here yeah. i read a little bit but i don't know but but basically you know if i try to just grow in the darkness <laughs> to answer your question you see how religions came about as i already mentioned you know while explaining shunyata everything is designated religion is also designated religion is also created by human mind like many other thing how religion came about religion came about because in human life there are so many problems which we can't solve Huh? There's so many problems which we can't solve. Then we started thinking, oh, there must be somebody who is powerful who will solve our problems. Because you get some benefit from the sun, then you started praying, sun god. Then people started pray, <laughs> praying trees, praying water, all the natural forces. They are very powerful, and people are helpless, you know. So they thought there is there is not just water, not just sun, but there must be. A, powerful being behind that sun god water god you know we came up with all these designations these are all human honestly speaking human creations and then some people like whether you call it pagan or whatever you know some people started praying even the images so there's why in buddhist buddhist you know temples also you see statues of buddha images and there are many other religions where where this is treated as idol worship and don't don't like that you know they don't put any images and things like that so because of this i remember very clearly there was a young israeli woman who was like dying to find somebody to teach her little bit of buddhism that was many many years back when i was working with his holiness so i said then uh, she met her she and she met me and i could clearly see that she is very interested and then and then she was asking where where can i find a teacher then i said it's not easy to find a teacher especially one who can you know speak in english so since you are so interested you just come i will teach you few days so i i thought of i don't know some days few four five days so one morning she came a little bit exasperated she came to me gishna today i'm a little bit disturbed i said what happened or people are you know worshiping to the the image then i said then i said then i said sit down sit down then i said when you travel do you take the photos of your parents or your brothers sisters she said yes yes i said you are stupid that photo is not your brother that photo is you are not you not your parent she said i know but this help me remind her remind me to my parents i said this is similar we are nobody stupid person saying this is buddha <laughs> this is only reminder <laughs> so when people don't understand the meaning behind then they think oh they are idol worshiping you know <laughs> so uh, kishila uh, in this human realm hmm. we <clears throat> say that everyone is equal but uh, we have two genders male and female hmm. so in terms of society and a girl's a female's physical body Mm. they suffer more than males mm. so what's the theory behind it theory behind i don't know but this is reality there are differences even among human beings some are stronger some are weak even among men there are some are very weak some are very strong some men are much much weaker than women so there are differences but then according to buddhism a person is judged not so much about the physical size and physical strength human being is basically judged based on the capacity of human mind in, in hindi we use the word purush purush means somebody who has the capacity to do something good huh so in terms of mental capacity there's no difference between men and women that's important physical differences are not that important especially if you think in terms of 
strength. Because if you measure the greatness of a person in terms of strength, then you are actually following the animal line, the animal way. Because animals, they, they have to depend primarily using physical force, not so much mind. So therefore, lion is king. Tiger is also <laughs> one of the kings or whatever, physically powerful. But human greatness of human beings is basically human mind. Then even if you think in terms of biological you know, differences, you, women have much, much more capacity to show love and affection. You know, most of the kids, they are, born, they are, they are brought up by the mother. Not so much father. <laughs> father only <laughs> is able to make child. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's the poor mother, you know, who really, like I've seen here, you know, many times people, you know, day and night. So much love and affection. So that capacity is there. So women, it looks like because of biological nature, they are more sensitive more they, they have the capacity to appreciate and receive more love and affection. I, I went around the world giving teachings to many, many places. Normally, majority of those who attend the teachings are women. Here also, I'm sure, women, women were out of number. Huh? Maybe. Most likely. Maybe this time, luckily, more or less same. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Mm. <clears throat> Hello, Gishala. Mm. Uh, my question is regarding mental health. Mm. We see so much hatred and toxicity on social media. Mm. No matter what you do, there is someone out there to criticize it, be it political uh, polarization or different inclination towards uh, due to various uh, brought up backgrounds per se. What do you suggest as a way to cater it responsibly? And before that, what do you think is the root cause of the same? This is not easy. My fundamental belief is the majority of people are good, especially ordinary people. Troublemakers are those who have the power because they have the power they have the police under their command, army under their command. <laughs> huh? So unnecessarily, then, then different political parties, you know. I mean, look, look anywhere, any country. You know, the, the oppos opposition party always criticizes the ruling government. The ruling government always criticize the opposition government. Actually, the, the, the reason to have an opposition party is to criticize and highlight the wrongdoing if it is happening. Otherwise, they should be supporting the government, saying this is wonderful. Every problem will be easily solved. But no, they play politics. So everything that the government does is wrong. Everything the other opposition party does is wrong. That's the problem. So they rule the country. Unfortunately, so that one man in the helms of affairs, he, he, he rules 10, 20 people who get the advantage of the post and the salary. They rule a little bit bigger circle, bigger circle. This is how the rest of the people are controlled. So we are, we are really like caught in a cobweb, helplessly caught in a you know, cobweb. So it's not easy, but but still, especially in democratic countries, people do have a say, big say during elections and things like that, or even other occasions. You know, if people maintain their sanity without going after, you know, unnecessarily going after political parties, religious factions, if you really be honest and think about what is the greater good, you know, then that will have its impact. But unfortunately, see, I don't know in any country, there's a huge population, totally illiterate. And they, they are like, so, so in the two sense of Trump, it's difficult to have democracy. We, we have only mobocracy. 
democracy definition of democracy is government of the people by the people for the people in mobocracy we have government by the cattle for the cattle of the cattle so <laughs> so therefore the only long term solution is educate people you know highlight what is really good for the masses and it's not easy because media is also to the line of this party that party <laughs> i don't know this is i would not say impossible but not that easy really and then 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 the, the leaders they have no genuine compassion and love for people they will say it in their speech but there is no genuine love no genuine compassion both bolnikili enough yeah namaste geshila hmm. so when last day we attended uh, we, we had a audience with uh, his holiness dalai lama hmm. so what he said is that he 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 is planning to envisage a kind of education system in which the ancient indian wisdom is incorporated with the modern western education okay so in the, with that background in my mind so my question is something related to yesterday what yesterday what he have taught us so if you want to understand the concept first we need to learn so we basically need to listen and then we need to think on it and then there is meditation part of it mm. so uh, i am thinking about how to make it practically possible in a school environment so the first part listening that's something we can understand as so a teacher will be taking the classes and students should be concentrated and to understand what it is and learn from the uh, guru and the second <coughs> part is thinking so what so what is it that we can do for the thinking part maybe if it is a 45 minute session 30 30 minutes teachers can teach and then give some time for them to uh, think but think on it or maybe as you have pointed out maybe give some kind of work so that they can engaged uh, get engaged on that once they go back to their home and that is in a way uh, kind of being practiced maybe you can give me more in insights into how to implement this in a school Yes, we have also been to TCV. So, and and what is the third part? Meditation. How can we give? How how can that be made possible in the daily life of students? So that the ultimate aim is that they can learn physics, chemistry, maths, everything. The using. So, how can we use this Indian wisdom in the modern education system? Thank you. Very good question. Yeah, out of his four commitments. his last commitment is revival of ancient indian tradition now when he talks about revival of ancient indian tra tradition he is really not talking about the rituals and ceremonies which may look uh, very grand and uh, very attractive but it's not going to solve your life's problems you know so again the 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 center point is that if you are to solve any problems that you face in your life you need to change yourself you should be able to think you you should be able to live the life not just following some ceremony or expecting some buddha or god you know <laughs> therefore the buddha said i have shown you the path to nirvana nirvana is up to you i mean i'm your class teacher you need to do the homework otherwise you will fail not only fail but fail miserably elsewhere he said the buddhas do not wash the sins of sentient beings with water the buddhas do not remove the negative state of existence of sentient beings with their hands buddhas cannot transfer their realization into the mind of others the buddhas can only show the path of truth the path of sajness and having shown the path of truth sajness you have to follow it and through the three threefold process of listening thinking and meditation so meditation as i mention yesterday meditation basically means living it you listen to it you think it confirm it it is useful then you have to live it on a regular basis right first you need to for example find out what is the meaning of compassion how many different types of compassions are there things like that you you get the definition you know the divisions and things like that then after that you 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 know see the usefulness of compassion and through repeated 
thinking you are, you are certain that this compassion is so important. You develop the conviction. Then after that, you have to, you have to be compassionate. Practice it. Live it. That's meditation. So it's only through meditation that you get totally transformed. So all these teachings are not for talking actually, they're for living. They're for living. In one of Buddha's teachings he says, if you want to taste the sweetness of the sugar cane, you know, you, need, you should not be satisfied with the bark, the peel, you know, but you should just go inside and taste the real sugar inside. You know? So there, there's the thing. And also when he talks about revival of ancient Indian tradition, as I said, he's not talking about any ritual and ceremony. He's primarily talking about the science of mind, science of emotions, and the art of logic and reasoning. Art of logic and reasoning. Meaning that you should find things by yourself through using your human intelligence. How far this seems to be true? Use reason, use logic. Don't be so gullible. And then study about your mind, the positive minds, negative minds, which one, which one is good for your health, which one is bad for your health, and then cultivate the, the useful ones and remove the destructive ones. That's extremely important. There's, there's a like, whole map of mind in the Buddhist teaching. And I believe in ancient Indian traditions also. Then also, having touched this subject, one thing that I would like to remind you is, if you look at the ancient Indian tradition, the religious tradition, the original Indian tradition is dialogue. Indian religion is a dialogue religion. There is no one book which you call, this, this is the book, ultimate book, from where everything originated. There are so many books in Hinduism. It's a dialogue religion. Then later on, Jainism, Buddhism, they are also dialogue religion. Dialogue religion means the teachers can teach, the students must ask questions. It's not one side. So similarly with others also, you know, people, everybody should have the right to ask questions and have dialogue. That's the beauty. So it's not said that you should follow everything blindly. Don't ask questions. Bhagavan ne bol diya, bol diya. Bas chup karo, is go follow karo. Aisa nahi bol diya. But now gradually, unfortunately, we are forgetting these special features. What the only thing we are learning is, Anka Mundage, Bas Mandir jao, Phul Fengo, Thora Sa Ganti Bajo, and then Pura Din Jur Bol Diya Rao. No, honestly speaking, this is, the, this is not religion. This fooling oneself. So which, which, whichever religion or God or whoever you follow, that's not important. The important is the message. How much you are living in accordance with that message. How much transformation you are able to bring in your life. That is important. Uh, Geshela, you said that in the beginning about nirvana, that it is dependent on causes and conditions. Mm -hmm. But you also said that the state in itself is permanent. Mm. That is, it's not dependent mm. on causes and conditions. Mm. So is it not contradictory? <laughs> uh, and the second question is, um, is bodhicitta and compassion, can they be used interchangeably or no, is no. bodhicitta more different, than different. compassion? Bodhic bodhicitta is more than compassion. Um, can you so explain? Compassion is one of the causes for development of bodhicitta. Okay, when we develop bodhicitta, there are two ways of developing bodhicitta. One is called seven cause effect relationship. <clears throat> that is, first you realize all sentient beings as your mother, remember their kindness, you develop wish to repay their kindness, then you develop loving, loving kindness, then you develop compassion, then you develop strong sense of responsibility. So these six are the causes, and the fruit is bodhicitta. Okay, another way of shorter, easier way of developing bodhicitta is the practice of exchanging oneself for others. That means, until now I've been primarily focused thinking about myself, I, me, mine, as I said yesterday. Now I should, because that, that process of thinking 
just about oneself is really the source of all kind of problems, difficulties. Me, 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 bolte hai na? Ahankar. Really source of problem. Because it makes your mind narrow. It creates fear. Things like that. So therefore now you should exchange that. Think more about others. Thinking more about others is actually good for you. You are not making a self-sacrifice. Therefore, His Holiness the Dalai Lama also says, if you want to be selfish, be wisely selfish. Wise selfish means if you think more about others, that's the wise way of being selfish. If you think just about yourself, it's the stupid way of selfish, being selfish. That's one thing. Then about this uh, nirvana, which is permanent. It, it, it is permanent, but you are not able to see it unless you refine yourself, unless you remove negative emotions and so forth. This is the ultimate nature of your mind, which you are not able to see unless you remove the obscuring factors. In order to remove all these obscuring factors, you need to cultivate positive emotions. You develop wisdom, understanding, shunyata, you develop loving kindness and so forth. So through these causal cause factors, gradually you are able to actualize that state. So in that sense. So we may be, strictly speaking, we cannot say these practices are causes for nirvana, but we can say these are the causes by which we actualize nirvana. Because nirvana, when we say it's a permanent, we cannot say it has a cause. But we can say it is dependent on many practices. Kishala, um, I want to go back to Tupsin's question when you said uh, a woman's capacity, it's more about the mind and not about our physical power. Hmm. Um, I want to slightly understand this, like I understand your views on, uh, you know, like for nuns, how the Geshema degree came about only in 2012. Yeah. And uh, we were discussing this among ourselves as well. And everyone told, when you think of a high lama, you don't think female, you just think male. And whenever there's a teaching happening, we saw everyone in the like <laughs> monastery. Uh, it was all monks primarily. Hmm. So, <laughs> just want to understand this a little more. So, so <laughs> as I said, whether it's a religion, history, politics, whatever, is all made by human mind. In other words, all this happenings and development takes place within a, within a cultural context. Unfortunately, I'm telling you, unfortunately, we are actually originated from animals. <laughs> unfortunately, all these neg strong negative emotions are there because of our animal, you know, root. Then we also inherited that animal way of ruling each other, meaning whoever is power control the rest of the people. So there, the human, the, the male, have physically more power. So every country, it's not only India or Tibet, everywhere it's like that. The male chauvinism, as we say. It continued to control. Still, to this day, many places are controlled. Women have less privilege. So it is because of this culture, it continued like that. And men become more dominant. And then, you know, sometimes, you know, you know how, it is, how, how difficult it is to bring about a big change in a you know, tradition which is already entrenched and established. Unless you, you know, unless you are Mike Lal, you know, <laughs> unless you are somebody really like great and respected, it's very difficult. People will start saying, kya kar hai? Traditions are chal kya kar hai? People will revolt against it. So it's, you know, strong people, respected people like His Holiness, who is able to say things, who is able to do things. So therefore His Holiness said, look, as I already mentioned, look, in terms of Buddhist practice, practice is done by mind. So men and women are same. So but because of this cultural, traditional way of doing things, women are lacking behind. 
But now, of course, we should not obstruct at least. And then he said, more importantly, he said, number one, from the Tibetan government side, or from him, if you find any obstruction, let us know, we'll remove that obstruction. So removal of obstruction alone is not enough. The women should also make concerted effort. Sometimes, unfortunately, even women are not so forthcoming. Although they talk about the women, right? But actually, practically, they are not very forthcoming. I tell you a story. Once I was invited for a very intimate conversation by the Tibetan Women's Association. It was not a conference, anything like that. They invited just few people, supposed to be liberal thinkers. <laughs> so, so I was invited and asked for some suggestion. I said, I have not much suggestion to give, but one thing that I really would like to do is first you should, you the women should start empowering the other women. Like among Tibetan women, if you find somebody who is a learned, you know, geshima, or who is eloquent, educated, arrange a talk, put her on the throne, and invite everybody. Many will come. This is the way to empower each other. But then you won't do that. This is human being. I mean, unfortunately, this human way of thinking, you see. So therefore, luckily now because of his all this, you know, we have this Geshe Maas and, and we have like many, now today Tibetan government is three ministers of women. The President Sijong is like trying his best to have as many women as possible. So we have only three, apart from Sijong, we have only three ministers, all are women. And recently he also appointed, I think, at least three uh, representatives of his holiness in, in Switzerland and Africa and other countries, also women, yeah. Um, just one more question. You want to become minister? No. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you think there's any downside to excessive reasoning that our generation indulges in? Yes, yes, true, true. That's why we use the word dry intellectual knowledge. See, if you, if you just keep on reasoning, keep on... This is a very good question. I have a very interesting story to tell you. <laughs> there was a monk at the time of the Buddha by the name Malokya. So he had received teachings from the Buddha. So he was meditating in his heart, small heart. And one day he thought, Buddha has been kind. He taught me many things. But there were many questions, many unanswered questions, things, you know, questions. The things that Buddha did not answer. So unless he answered all these questions, I don't feel comfortable continuing my training under him. I might go to some other teacher for my training. So he went straight to the Buddha and said the same thing. And then the Buddha said, first of all, I'm not looking for student. You go wherever you want to go. Did I say that you should become my student? A little bit of scolding almost. And then he said, now listen. With your question, I'll give you an answer. The parable of the arrow. You must have heard about this. Very famous story, parable of the arrow. The parable of the arrow says, the Buddha, Buddha recounted this by saying that if somebody shot you from a distance and the arrow struck you and you're bleeding, what will you do? Will you keep on asking all the philosophical questions? Who, who shot the arrow? How strong the arms of that person? Whether the shooter has a mouse stage or not? What is the stuff by which the bow is made of? <laughs> what is the stuff by which the arrow is made of? What kind of you know, wood? wood? So many types of wood are there. And what was the speed? You know, even with these small incidents, if you keep on asking all the questions, it will almost be an endless question. And if you say, I will not take the medication unless I get all the philosophical answers, long before you will be a dead person before you get the answers. So therefore, I'm not interested you know, in trying to answer to many of these things, which is not relevant to our removal of our suffering. And he said, look, there's so much suffering among human beings. So my urgent you know, 
The urgent thing that I need to do is how to address and minimize this suffering, this problem. That is my concern. So therefore, I'm not talking about many of these complicated questions when the university or university, universe originated, whether there is a afterlife, you know, so many things. Can I just yeah. follow-up question? Hmm. So when should, like, when should we know that, uh, like, what is the line? When do I stop reasoning? Like, you know, when should I know that, chalo, I should just take this person's word? The purpose of reasoning, the purpose of reasoning is to find the truth. Okay. Once you've found the truth, no more asking. Then you have to practice it, you have to follow it, you have to keep it in your mind and, you know, follow it. And this is related to what I said yesterday also. There's no need for you to know everything. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So, in modern world, it is called specialization. Um, Geshala, I wanted to ask, can one attain enlightenment in female body? Because in uh, Jainism, uh, I've been reading that uh, there's a caveat that only one born in a uh, male form in male body can only uh, lead to that part. Are there some caveats here too? In Buddhism also there is such an explanation. These are all culture, like Tibetan culture come from India. We followed faithfully many of these things. So those mentions are also there. But if you look at the latest, the highest tantra, Kala Chakra Tantra, it says yes. So that, that looks like, you know, uh, Correcting the mistakes, past mistakes. <laughs> I mean, as I said, I mean, use your common sense, you know. Enlightenment is a state of mind, not of the body. Even if it is the body, so what is wrong with the women body? Nothing wrong. If you, term, if you talk in terms of filthiness, there's no difference at all. Right? And when we talk about getting enlightenment, we are not going to shoot somebody bringing the sophisticated heavy arms, we are not going to take all those things. <laughs> so this is a common sense. Yes, of course. Yeah. Geshela, mm. as the word enlightenment is coming again and again in our conversation, mm. and the word enlightenment uh, reminds me of Buddha, the enlightened one. Mm. As also you said that gaining enlightenment is like somewhat next to impossible. Mm. I would <laughs> like to know from you that how did the Buddha realize that he has gained enlightenment? And I would also like to know the characteristics or the traits to know that a person has gained enlightenment or is in a verge of gaining enlightenment. Yeah, number one, as I said, almost impossible not to discourage you. But the fact is, in case of the Buddha, as an example that you put, we say, he achieved enlightenment after countless eons of practice. Eons, I'm saying. Countless also. Now here you have to, number one, believe in future lives. Then countless lives. So in that sense, not easy. But not easy doesn't mean that you can't make progress. Like even reaching Delhi is not easy. But when you start moving, each, each step is taking you closer, closer to Delhi or wherever you want to go and then finally you will be there. So like that, this has no implication at all saying that you can't make progress. You, you can make progress. That is enough for us. That we can make progress. We can become better and better. At least in this life we will be much, much happier. All these things are achievable, concrete. So that, that, is, that is enough. What was the other question? Oh, the characteristic is, number one, he has completely eliminated all negative emotions. Then also, if you read, I don't remember each and everything, if you read the last chapter of the Abhisamaya Alamkara, the ornament of realization, then it talks about uh, 32 major signs, 80 minor signs. Like his ear lobes will be longer and his hair will be completely like black huh? and, uh, and his tongue and uh, uh, lips also like uh, 
reddish, like a bimba, I don't know, bimba, a fruit, something like that. Then his like, hands and legs are webbed like a duck. And then having a will, you know, think, many things are explained. So read that. Geshe-la, mm. what is the significance of different deities in Vajrayana Buddhism? For example, Green Tara, White Tara, Vajrayogini. And how are these practices helpful for one's spiritual progress, mm. like on the path of mm. enlightenment? Mm. And if we want to learn more about this or study more about this, then how sh what, what approach should we? Few things you need to know. Number one, why do we have so many commodities in a mall? When you go to a mall, why there are so many commodities there? Huh? Because our needs are you need something, she needs something, he needs something, you know? So, so your, your need is different, your interest is different, your disposition is different. So therefore you need so many things. So likewise when you practice also, depending upon your mental disposition, some people will like green color, some people will like white color, some people will like wrathful, powerful deity, you know? I need a strong deity, wrathful huh? deity. Then some people, they, they get scared of this wrathful deity, you know. And they, they like Avalokiteshwara, peaceful deity. And some people want very simple deity. Some people like, want complicated deity, you know. So the, a crazy mind has so much demand, you know. So, so accordingly, <laughs> Accordingly, they are not necessarily that there is a deity like that sitting up there waiting for you to pray. Actually, it's, I think it's a very good development. Almost like the start of the modern you know, art and things like that, you see. So showing things in, in forms, or different colors, and then there is interpretation of all these colors, all these hand, hand, hand implement, things like that. So there's a different... Uh, a wise way of uh, helping different people. You don't have to follow each and every deity. Whichever deity you want, practice that nicely. So therefore there is a saying, now, no, no, as an Indian you should be a little bit proud. I don't know whether you will be happy with that. India, how much deity? 33 crore. 33 crore, see? The Tibetans may Jew have nothing to Hindu tradition, you talk about 33 crores, imagine. But there is also a saying, which is, which, which is a compliment to the Indians. They say that Indians, they practice one deity and they achieve all the deities. Tibetans pra practice 100 deities, don't achieve even a single one. <laughs> so the, the, the meaning is that you should really like focus on one thing properly. There are different manifestations, like manifestation in the form of a deity of compassion of Buddha, of wisdom of Buddha. They're all basically the same. So what should be our approach? Like, uh, how would I know like, what are the deities available and what deities are available? Are you shopping deities? No, like if I want to study, like I want to get help from some deity, then how, like, I, I tried to ask uh, some people, but no one, I, I could not get answer about this thing. So sometimes, you know, the, the, when, when there is a actual then the initiation, then there is a time when you, you know, get up, take a flower, and through that flower in that skewer mandala, which defects different direction of different deities. So in whichever direction that flower fell, that is your chosen deity. Okay. There's one way we normally do, it's almost like a traditional way of doing things, but in, I would say that basically, Depending upon your mental affinity, feeling of closeness, you can choose the deity. Right? And when you really select, like when you select your girlfriend, <laughs> you don't go to a square board and throw the flower. <laughs> you study about that girl, ask questions about the family. So similarly, study about Avalokiteshvara, <laughs> Manjushri, you know. Then if you think this is a really good deity for me, just follow it.
Okay, so if I chose a deity, then what should be the next uh, things to like, how, who will guide me and where should I study things uh, regarding this? Then, then uh, of course, you can gather some knowledge by reading books. When you have to find a reliable teacher? How? Yeah. Where can I find the teacher? If I show the teacher, then say, <laughs> so many. No, honestly speaking, you know, before you study Tantra, you should study Sutra. Because this deity thing comes in Tantric practice. When you study Sutra, then that will help you understand the meaning of the Tantra. Especially when you study Shunyata, then even the deity is meditated as having no inherent existence. You know? And then what is symbolized by the deity? All this has to be studied. The end purpose is basically development of loving kindness, compassion, and so forth. But then, then, then take practice said to be a quicker path. It has its meaning also. Quicker path. Why we need to choose a quicker path? Because there's so much suffering. I'm as an able one day I'll achieve enlightenment. As I postpone Matakaro. There's urgency. So that's why you go to the so called tantric practice. But then there is no, no way to outreach it. You know, just as you go to the, move to the second floor, you have to go step by step. Right? So in order to follow that quick tantric path, you have to at least have some foundation in the sutric practice. And then if you really think, you first you study a little bit about tantra, and then if you really think you want to practice, then, you know, attend one of his holiness, some other, you know, Teachers tantric teaching, receive tantric empowerment, and then read more, study more, and practice. Vishnu, can you talk a little bit about the philosophical differences between the two of the different schools and how they came into You see, whether you talk about Sutra and Tantra or the four philosophical systems, these are, you know, the different skillful ways by the Buddha to lead, you know, his students. Because you can't teach PhD subject to a kindergarten going child. Although the ultimate aim is to do the PhD. So first you just teach the subjects taught to the kindergarten students. So similar like that. And uh, so therefore, when you talk about the, the uh, uh, it has to be understood like this. Number one, you need to understand that all the sufferings that we experience in the samsara, they are caused by self-grasping. Self-grasp means seeing things as having inherent existence. However, understanding that selflessness is not easy. It is very subtle and profound. So therefore, the, the step-by-step -step process is, first you understand impermanence. With that also, it is more difficult to understand subtler meaning of impermanence, so you should develop grosser meaning of impermanence. And then, uh, selflessness or emptiness and so forth. Now the differences between these schools is primarily in terms of their interpretation of the philosophical view, the view of Shunyata. Uh, So therefore, one of the texts says, although your aim is to understand the highest philosophical view propounded by Madhamika school, but you will not be understand it unless you go step by step. So 
especially without touching your own process of perceiving things. It will make no sense to discuss about whether things exist independently or not independently, things like that. The Vebashika philosophy and the South Antarctica philosophical school and also the mind only school. I'm just briefly explaining it. Especially the first two schools, Vyabhashika and South Antigua, they only talk about selflessness of person. They don't, don't talk about selflessness of phenomena. There's one difference. Then the mind only school talks about selflessness of phenomena. The Swatantrika Madhimikas also talks about selflessness of phenomena and person. But the, the common thread with all of these schools is they say uh, things exist from their own side. Things don't exist truly, but things exist from their own side. Apne or se bhi hona chahiye. Nam bhi hum deta hai. We also give the designation, but they should also exist from their own side. Because if there's nothing existing from their own side, then to what are we going to give the name? So both must come together, existing from its own side and also giving the name. And now the high school, the Prasankirka Madhimikul, they say this is contradictory. If things exist from their own side, what is the need to give a designation? For example, if, 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 you, if you have a child and the child says, I did the homework myself, that means he has not sought the help of the parents. If he says that in order to do the homework, I sought the help of my mother and also I did it myself, <laughs> this is contradictory. Right? So the Parasankhika Madhyamikul say things do not exist. Dependently, independently, things do not exist. Intrinsically, things do not exist. Inherently, things do not exist. From their own side, they are all same, synonymous. But the lower schools, they say things must exist from their own side. That's the main difference. Okay? Oh, acha, 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 acha. You're talking about that. They basically, they all follow the Madhyamika school. They all follow Madhyamika school. The little bit differences in emphasis because they follow different terms and terminologies and follow different lamas who established their school. So these are, these are minor differences, but they all follow the Madhyamika school. But then also if you, you talk about the view, then like Chonangwa view is different. Okay, things, things, things like that. Yeah. Um, Vishila, uh, we are the generation that is trained to uh, always question, mm. to reason, and such a shallow reason that, you know, we can't make ourselves believe that it's beyond our eyes or ears. <coughs> and, uh, and hence we see a rise, this age of atheism. Mm. So how do I, you know, make myself open to, mm. to something that is beyond physics, something that is metaphysical, and how do I embark on this journey of spiritual enlightenment or even betterment? Because that's what I felt that, you know, whenever I try to even meditate, I always question that what I'm feeling, whether it's just my mind playing games with me, or am I actually having experiences? Even when my others tell me about their experiences, I question them. Mm. So how do I make myself open to something that is, you know, beyond my own mind or brain? So, no, as I said, yesterday I spoke about three types of phenomena, manifest, slightly hidden, completely hidden. So for understanding this, you use diff direct senses, then inferential cognition, then what other people say, things like that. But at the end of the day, you should be able to confirm it through your direct experience. The purpose of reasoning and everything is, at the end of the day, you should be able to experience it through your direct experience. Now, direct experience means experience by your senses, 
Senses is not the five senses alone. It includes your mental sense, mental consciousness, right? So, so that way it will become a kind of living, felt experience. Okay. But then, how do I open myself to that as well? How do I start? You know, where do I start? So the question is. <laughs> Like, for example, when you eat an apple, you know, instead of like not seeing the apple and talking about apple, and seeing the apple and talking about apple is different. So at the level of the, the manifest phenomena, you should directly see it. Don't just listen to other people. You will not get much idea if you just listen to other people. How 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 did the, how does this fruit apple look like? It's roundish. It's small seed inside. It is bitter, sour, whatever. You can hear all about. Oh, this is apple, but you have no idea. You don't need that big description. Just just cut an apple, eat it, see it. That's the end of story. So so what I'm saying is, with the manifest level, you should you should definitely go and explore, find things by yourself. If, if you do that, that itself is a big progress. Because most of us, kahi suni baat. Most of us run after what people say, what came out in the news. You don't take that time and energy and effort to find things. Because of that, we spread so much rumor, gossip. All this rumor and gossip, spreading of rumor and gossip will stop if you start doing that. Then second level, as I said, reason it. And then Grigian, you yes, this is true. There's no other possibility. So that is experience. Okay? Yeah. And once you develop that experience, then you have to live it continuously. It might sound a little naive, uh, but at times uh, I have a question that why everything comes came into an existence. Hmm. Uh, whether it's uh, whether it's the Brahm in Hinduism uh, that was responsible for creating life, or basically because of the human karma here. But what why it came into existence? Why was it at first place there? Why do we? Why, what we are doing, we are doing. <laughs> why, the why, why, why not come into existence? I mean, you can ask similar question. Why not come into existence? But the, there could be some reason behind that. Reason, yes. Reason, as I said, the, the, the causes and conditions are there. And then our main problem is, as you are hinting, our main problem is to try to pinpoint and locate the first, you know, the egg and the hen story. Who came first? Not also why first, yeah. why at all? <laughs> why not? Like why, why not? I'm saying why not? Why is this form of life, or probably any form of life, has come into existence? If at all, I mean, what could have been the basic intention of this? There, there, there's your main question. There's no basic intention. There's no basic intention. So this makes you feel a little... Let, let me read this. Let me read this. This will give you some answer. This is, this is from Bertrand Russell. There are forces making for happiness and forces making for misery. We do not know which will prevail, but to act wisely, we must be aware of both. He admonishes against confusing the philosophy of nature, in which such neutrality is necessary with the philosophy value, which begins us to create 
meaning by conferring human values upon the world. So that is what, what he's saying, basically. The world has no intention. Because of coming together of certain causes and conditions, because of coming together of different elements, things come into being. We cannot talk about value in that level. Values are <laughs> put by human beings. Nature is only a part of what we can imagine. Everything real or imagined can be appraised by us and there is no outside standard to show that our valuation is wrong. We are ourselves the ultimate and irrefutable arbiters of value. And in the world of value, nature is only a part. Thus in the world, we are greater than nature. In the world of values, nature is itself, nature in itself is neutral, neither good nor bad, deserving of neither admiration nor censure. It is we who create value and our desires which confer value. It is for us to determine the good life, not for nature. Nature is like a playground. It's there. Not even for nature. This is what he's saying. Not even, it is for us to determine the good life, not for nature, not even for nature personified as God. It's not their job. And then he summarizes, Russell's definition of the good life remains the simplest and most heartening one I have ever encountered, which actually you know, I was struck. He was actually touching the heart of Buddhism. And then he says, the good love is one inspired by love and guided by knowledge. Compassion and wisdom that we have been talking about. And then there are many more things. But the point, point I am, the more important thing is, you know, the world itself, the existence itself, we can't say it is a meaning. That's what I'm trying to say. We make meaning out of it. We create value out of it, as he said. And the, the fact that we have to accept is, whether you like it or not, we are here, we are born. Whether you like it or not, the world is here. Things are here. So how you can take the best out of that existence? So therefore, that this arrow, the <laughs> arrow caution, <laughs> doesn't make you know much sense or not so... Uh, Relevant, yeah. Uh, my question may sound nihilistic and very negative. Yeah. But like you said, we are here. Mm. And so can't we just, you know, if we realize that life is uh, basically, like there's no ultimate meaning or purpose. And, and there's suffering and the goal of our life is just to get, you know, freedom. So can't we just stop producing and just be trees or animals or, you know, can't we do that? Why, why do we have to force a conscious life into this world and then make that life wonder about these big questions? And then we are, we are not creating a conscious life. Conscious, when you are here, you are conscious. But a we are not is making it. A mother is like, it be, she becomes a mean hmm. of bringing another life, a conscious life into the world. Hmm. And then that poor life will come. Hmm. She will question the world. Hmm. And then that poor life will bring another life. Hmm. So it's a cycle. So can't hmm. we just stop this and be a tree? And just be, you know, <laughs> why? Few answers. One is, I would say, you are developing a very pessimistic attitude. <laughs> no, I'm joking, I'm joking. <laughs> but what, what I would really like to say is this important. Also, from Buddhist perspective or even otherwise. In Buddhism, we say there is suffering. But we are never, we never say, or never saying, life is just suffering. In Ebola, there is happiness also. A lot of happiness also. Most of the time I saw you smiling, not crying. You're happy. That's the purpose of human life. But we talk about the fact that there is suffering because this is something we must be careful, we must remove to get better happiness, more reliable, long-lasting happiness. That's one thing. The second 
you or your mother really doesn't have much capacity to stop life. Even if you control like population here. Okay? And you think, you know, you, these people die and they will never come, never be born in New Delhi, but they will be born somewhere. Either in America or in some other world, other realm. You, you can never stop consciousness to come back again. There's no, no way to do it. Yes, in a particular place, you know, you can, you know, do a little bit of population control, things like that. But you can just a, just a thought. I'm not actually going to, like, force people to <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, so there, there's no way you can just put an end to everything. Yeah. What is happiness enough? <laughs> what else you want? <laughs> no, but love, I don't know. I mean, we see, like, people all talk about how, you know, uh, suffering is it's getting just greater and bigger than happiness. You know, this world, what we live in, like my parents... This suffering is becoming greater because of our own actions. actions. And it's clear that we want greater happiness. And we can do it. Therefore, we are talking about the need to transform our mind. It is possible. Mm. So therefore, yesterday, as I, I said, it is not so much how long you live. That's the main problem. People think I want happy and continuously, you know, that's very difficult, so why should I live, things like that. No, that is, that is wrong. Mm. मेरा क्वेश्चन है कि अभी तक जितने भी क्वेश्चन हैं इन सब से थोड़ा थोड़ा रिलेटेड है हाँ कि कैसे जो कर्मा हम पास कर्मा की बात करते हैं और प्रेजेंट कर्मा के बोलते हैं लोगों का जैसे कोई जेंडर की बात कर रहे थे कास्ट क्रीड रेस हर चीज पे डिफरेंट डिफरेंट डिवीजन की बात करते हैं हम यहाँ पे हाइब्रिड है तो कहीं सोशल कंस्ट्रक्शन के थ्रू पॉलिटिकल कंस्ट्रक्शन के थ्रू जैसे वर्ल्ड या नेशन स्टेट में डिफरेंसेस हैं इन सारों के तो मैं इनको सफरिंग जो है जो कर्मा हम बात कर रहे हैं तो उनको इग्नोरेंस के साथ ये चीजें सबसे पहले देख रहा था कि ये चीजें रिलेटेड हैं या नहीं हैं और सबसे लास्ट में ये है कि इग्नोरेंस जो हम सारे ह्यूमन जो हम कर्मा के साथ पास्ट और प्रेजेंट के साथ जी रहे हैं और हम ऑल ह्यूमन आर इग्नोरेंट क्योंकि किसी ने कोई पावर बनाया होगा तो वो उसके इग्नोरेंस के कारण भी है कि मतलब तो इस इग्नोरेंस को हम कैसे खत्म कर सकते हैं इग्नोरेंस को खत्म करने के लिए पहले आपको जानना चाहिए कि अविद्या क्या होता है अविद्या क्या है इग्नोरेंस मीन्स अविद्या प्लीज सी डाउन और अविद्या से दुख कैसे होता है यू नो दिस हिंदी वर्ड दुख दुखा द टू वर्ड एक्चुअली कॉम्बिनेशन ऑफ टू लेटर्स दुखा and sukha so basically dukha and sukha basically means like uh, uh, kha is like the whole you know when you, when you drive a chariot you have that wheel and in that where you put the axle there is a hole and when that hole is duk du means not good then the wheel will not <laughs> turn smoothly dukha if that that hole where the axle goes is you know oiled and uh, smooth then the wheel will move very very easily so this is the example so in life also if you have those negative emotions then your life will of your life will not go very smoothly if you have the other one your life will of life will go very smoothly take it so therefore you need to understand how ignorance produces suffering i other day i give you the example of the snake the rope and the snake because of lack of ignorance, he thought this rope is a snake and it got completely frightened. Dukhwana. This means the only thing that will help you to remove that misconception is light. Now here in this case, wisdom, knowledge. Now for example, knowledge, wisdom means, as I discussed when I was explaining impermanence, when I have this wisdom that we are all exactly the same, wanting happiness, not wanting suffering, still having suffering, still having not much happiness, things like that. Then we are all semen going to die after 10, 20 years, things like that. Once you develop this kind of wisdom, then where is the need to make unnecessary segregation, division, bullying, exploiting? 
मतलब नहीं बनता है कुछ दिस द पॉइंट and when you don't have this understanding then you know you just get popped up with a little bit of money little bit of name little bit of fame then you you know head high up in the sky ha bhai aaj kal kaise hain ha karte hai na you get popped up there's no reason at all to get get arrogant and popped up when you understand the real life situation the only thing that makes sensible is the show love show affection show kindness help others as much as possible your life will be so happy so peaceful and reduce your this excessive attachment to things aur chahiye aur chahiye aur chahiye kitna chahiye aapko the buddha said i'm very happy because i have nothing and for us we say i have this so i'm a little bit happy i still want more अरे वो मोर कहाँ से आएंगे एवरी कंट्री थिंक्स अबाउट यू नो प्रोग्रेस इन एवरी ईयर द जी डी पी शुड ग्रो एवरी ईयर जी डी पी ग्रोथ मीन्स मेटेरियल डेवलपमेंट है ना मेटेरियल डेवलपमेंट कहाँ से आए सो वेयर वेयर वट इज द सोर्स ऑफ दैट मेटेरियल डेवलपमेंट द एक्सटर्नल नेचुरल रिसोर्सेज वाटर फॉरेस्ट एनवायरमेंट दिस एक्सटर्नल रिसोर्सेस आर physical resources anything that is physical material means there is a limitation pani bhi simit hai hawa bhi simit hai pair pode bhi simit hai natural resources bhi simit hai how can, how are you going to make unsimit how are you going to make unlimited progress from limited resources as simple as that if you they get that wisdom then you know contentment is the most important thing mahatma gandhi said that there is enough for everybody's need but not enough for everybody's greed it is the greed which is destroying everything abhi delhi mein jao hawa kaise pani kaise similarly go to any other big cities the so called intelligent human beings see the result of this intelligence go to some big cities when there is i have seen it myself go to some big cities if there is one hour of rain all roads are flooded ye har sal ka kahani yahi hai kya hum log ek road bhi theek se tircha karke nala theek se nahi kar sakte itna paisa nahi hai humko kya because we don't care about others sirf apna pocket badhna bas kuch nahi this the tragedy and then when you do that you will also suffer you you also whoever power however powerful you are you also have to live in delhi you also have to breathe that air bach ke kitna kahan ja sakta tu we don't know this this is misconception this is ignorance so at the at the at the end of the day what i'm saying is because of such ignorance as i already mentioned we are basically towards committing a global suicide to isliye bolta hai ki the great teachers like buddha they are saying jago 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 abhi so so raha hai ab gehre nind mein so raha hai khara nahi mar raha hai jago awakening mindfulness meditation <laughs> these are important you see and we don't have that we don't care chalta hai chalta hai chalta hai i've seen seemingly educated people in big cities i've seen seemingly educated people in, especially in around 6 7 pm they all go to the market because it's a little bit cooler they come in their fancy cars and there's no place proper place to park and then they eat everything and they just throw it as if india is a dumping ground i mean this mentality we have to change and i have i've said about this many times is it is india dustbin <laughs> is india garbage bin no you have to you know simplify your thinking sir at least i should stop doing that so now because you have attended this talk next time if you start practicing this at least not be a contributor to the garbage and dustbin you you did your job small things like that we we can all do you know how how sizzle and now so clean 
You know the story how it became clean? Switzerland was also like, like any other country, it was not very clean in the beginning. Then some of the teachers, they taught the students in the classroom how not to throw all the garbage and collect garbage from the forestry, things like that. Then the students, when they saw parents doing that, they said, you can't do this. Parents learned from the students. Students learned from the teacher. Now if you throw something like that, everybody look like this. You see, so it's just all learning. So therefore, the purpose of such Gurukul program is not so much about studying Buddhism, but awakening. And there you can learn a lot from Buddhism also. But the important thing is you just you just contribute. You are, you, are, you are going to be, you are all, I know you are all very educated, very smart. And you're lucky because you're young. <coughs> so you can make much contribution. Bringing more unity among diverse religions, more unity among different communities. Don't make these small divisions. You should always remember divisions are made by people who have small mind. small mind, both mind. Really? This is the way to change our country. And as a Tibetan, I'm happy to, you know, give this kind of talk and share, encourage young people. Because we Tibetans consider ourselves, number one, Tibetans have very close spiritual connection with India. I'm not saying this because we are now refugee and living here. I'm not saying this. There's a hundred thousands, thousands of years of history. It's not so much economical connection, not so much political connection, spiritual connection. How many young Tibetans have sacrificed their life to come to India to study Buddhism. In those days, at the time of Thimis Sambhata, Lozawa, Rinchen Sangbo, many of these great Naksa Lozawa, great translators, when they came, you know, many, like batch of 25 students come, they have to travel, there was no road, nothing. And the Tibetan kings used to send gold to offer to the Indian teachers. And because people knew that these Tibetans, they would come with the gold, many of them were just massacred and killed on the road. Only few, two, three people make it. And then they studied at the foot of Indian teacher and brought all this wisdom. Now you see the conjure and danger, you know, 300 volumes. Not in, not in India, though. all lost, right? So there also you have a responsibility to restore this tradition back and bring, you know, back, give it back to the, to, to, to Indians, right? So that's important because everybody wants to enjoy the fruit. Nobody takes the responsibility for the goodness of the country, for the goodness of the people. Then, kaise <laughs> hoga? Yeah. Gishla, uh, uh, so I was born and brought up in a circumstances in which uh, I was always told that there is a purpose in my life. Yeah. And the purpose is already determined. And yeah. my purpose is to ultimately reach God. Okay. So ultimately I'll, reach God. Uh, uh, yes. So that's the, <coughs> and then I started reading. Mm. That's, the, that's the only way in which mm. I, mm. I, I, I knew how I could make sense of my world around. So one of the books that I've read was uh, Viktor Frankl's uh, book. Mm. Uh, he was a Jewish psychologist. Mm -hmm. He was imprisoned in Auschwitz mm. uh, under Hitler's regime, but mm. he, he could escape from that. So he, he uh, wrote this book called Man's Search for Meaning. Mm. And what uh, one of the main t uh, main ideas from that book that I got is that uh, whatever meaning that you give to your life, that is what relevant to you. It's not necessary that you should take a predetermined meaning or purpose that is given. Mm. Uh, so I want uh, I felt that this is uh, when when you just now said about uh, read about uh, Bertrand Russell's, I kind of felt as if this this is in line with it. Uh, I want to know if it is line with it or different. First yeah, thing. yeah. Second, I, one more question. Next mm. is a question. So, uh, so I have been reading about uh, Buddhism, mm. and when I went to the Tibetan Library of Works, there was a section of free copy, mm. and I took one book mm. because it was free, of course. Uh, so I took this book. Then uh, I started. Like I have a basic idea of Buddhism. So one of the starting point is that the world is full of suffering. Yes, but in my personal life, I have gone through not much, but still, hmm. that whatever suffering that I have gone through is relevant to me. 
and I don't hesitate uh, to go through suffering or or say consider that to be a bad experience because all those experience made me relook to my own values and philosophy and realize that okay these things are not suitable and allowed me to give up on them mm. and to adopt values with the changing circumstances and time mm. so uh, my so that's why I, I have a different set of values altogether different mm. from what I was uh, initially with mm. so uh, my question is uh, I want to understand as to what does suffering in Buddhism means uh, I, now I feel that suffering in not is not same uh, same as that of an uh, English sense mm. Mm. It, I mean, I hold the value that sufferings are not bad. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, thank you. So, with your first question, I also read that book. And in that book, as far as I remember, he was basically saying the only quality and factor which made him survive in the concentration camp was his love for his wife. So, love is very powerful. Otherwise, he could have died long before, like many of those others. His longing and love for his family and his wife made him survive. It's very moving. I read that book. So, love is, in a sense, we can say love is the meaning of human life. As I mentioned right in the beginning, that we survive biologically, we need love and affection. Right? So, that's important. And then second, with the, this question of suffering, you know, suffering, this English word itself is not very uh, relevant. No, basically what we are talking about is a state of having no satisfaction, unsatisfactory state. Basically, that is what we are talking about. Because things that we have are not satisfying, not enough, so therefore we have problem, uneasiness. So that we call it as a kind of suffering. That's one way of looking at things. Generally speaking, there is suffering. But then, according to Buddhism, there are many dimensions of suffering, out of which many of these sufferings, they are sufferings, but we have no clue, no understanding that they are sufferings. We have some idea about the first level of suffering, which is called suffering of suffering. That means when you get headache or bag ache or things like that, then you know, animals also know, human beings also know. So this suffering of suffering, manifest level of suffering, we have some idea. Then there is a deeper level of suffering which is called suffering of change, which we unfortunately see their suffering of change as not suffering but as happiness. Okay? For example, now you have been sitting here over two hours. So you are already experiencing a little bit of suffering of change. Huh? Ave Guruji Bhagavad Khatam Karne Siti. Sojra Ho Gapman Me. All right, so don't worry, another five minutes. <laughs> so, so, you know, in economics we have this word, law of marginal utility. You see? And then you will have experienced that again very soon when you go for your lunch. Because you are hungry, the first few mouthfuls are very nice. But then keep on eating. <laughs> Law of suffering. That is very important to understand, suffering of change. Because with whomever we associate, whichever place we stay, gradually it is revealed its true nature. That it will not be able to give us long-lasting happiness and satisfaction. So once you understand, then, then you know, okay, these are the not, not the real source of happiness. I have to seek the real happiness from somewhere else. And then there is a third level of suffering which is much, much deeper, which is called conditioned suffering. Conditioned suffering means that your very existence is product of negative emotions or, you know, contaminated karma. I mean, look at your psychophysical aggregate. It is not made of diamond or not even stone, you know. And because of this, it is, it is definitely susceptible to all kinds of problems. Plus, in addition to the fragility of the body, plus our you know, unethical way of life or unconscious way of life, how we feed ourselves, where we go, all this contribute to more suffering. 
So therefore, if you really want to get long-lasting happiness, then you, to, you need to get rid of, you need to take a new life, which is not product of negative emotions, which is a product of wisdom. So that's the idea. So that, that is basically the general explanation of suffering. Then for practitioners, for, for really good practitioners who have refined their mind, who have seen the lack of inherent existence of everything, who have seen impermanent, then for this great masters, there is nothing called suffering in one sense. They will, if you say this is suffering, they will laugh at you. What do, what do you mean by suffering? It's relative, it's how you see things. You see? The so-called suffering for one person may be a source of joy for that other person. And especially for you know, practitioners, Suffering is introduction to happiness. I very often use the word, instead of suffering, I use the word challenge. <coughs> if you don't confront challenge, you will not become tough, you will not become, you will not learn anything. That's what I said yesterday, if you continue to remain in the comfort zone, <laughs> not come out, not experience the new challenges and new situations, you will never grow. So suffering is your teacher. Challenges are your teacher. It is only when you grapple with these sufferings, these problems, these challenges, you grow. Otherwise, you will never grow. The so-called great people become great because they have struggled with suffering, struggled with the challenges, learn new things. And in life also, it really looks like when you confront problems, it's very menacing right at the beginning, but you learn so many things. For example, if you never got sick, you have no idea what, what, what it means to be sick, or what it, more importantly, what it means to be healthy. When you get sick, then you know, oh, I wish I'm not sick, then I can do this, I do that. When you're healthy, you don't do. That's the problem, you see. <laughs> you see? So these are like uh, uh, teachers, teachers, learning experiences, right? So therefore, suffering is introduction to happiness. And, and therefore, if you have the right frame of the mind, then you have no problem. There are some Buddhist teachers who are highly trained in the mind, you know, undergone their mind training. They say, if I'm going to die today, wonderful. It's not like I'm scared, you know. They say, if I'm going to die today, wonderful. Not in a pessimistic sense, but they say, if I'm going to die today, wonderful because I'm not going to continue to live creating suffering upon other people, see? But they are not pessimistic. In the same way, they say, if I'm not going to die today, but rather going to live 100 years, it's wonderful. Then I'll continue to live and benefit so many other people, you see? So when you have this dedication to continuously help other people, benefit other people, whatever is there, wonderful. But if you get obsessed with yourself all the time, what is it? 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 Okay? Good news. 